Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Stay Hot Film Review with me, Theo. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about Justin Fields, where I think his strengths are, where his weaknesses still are, how they've structured the offense, and what they can do this offseason to really take this thing over the top. What position should they be prioritizing? What type of receiver should they be prioritizing? Or should they look at offensive linemen or even defense and ignore the, the offense? These are all questions that I'm exploring in this film review. So with that being said, let's get right into it and talk a little bit about Justin Fields. This play is peak Justin Fields. I could probably just end the video after showing you this one because it perfectly encapsulates all of his strengths and weaknesses in one moment here but I'll make the video longer than just this clip, so sorry, folks. But anyway, this is a nifty route concept that they've got here. You've almost got like a scissors concept with Cole Komet running this post, and then there being a, a corner route from Mooney, and then you've got like this out and in in front of them. And when you look at this out and in that I think Byron Pringle is running, that kind of keeps this defender down, which opens up this whole shot for Mooney, right? You see the high-low that that creates right here. He's kind of breaking outside. This defender stays down. You've got Mooney running in behind him, right? And then later, you've got this big post brings up this Mike linebacker, uh, getting him out of the play. And then you've got this out and in running in behind him, right? So it's a good bit of route running. It's a good bit of, uh, it's a good concept, but it takes a while to develop and you need good blocking, which Fields has here. And Fields is so rattled from his history of bad blocking that he gets to the top of his drop and no one's open and watch. He immediately like freaks out. Whoa, 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 where is everybody? Like immediately starts scrambling, getting his feet uneven, right? There's no pressure here, but he's still freaking out. And then he's like, oh, no one's around me. And then he settles back down. Now at this point, Byron Pringle is, is running into a lot of open space here and there's nothing preventing Fields from just making that throw. He's looking directly at it. It's clearly about to be open. There's no pressure. Make the throw, right? Or, you know, you could probably even hit the whole shot here. But the easy throw that would pick up a first down is just, all right, throw it into the space that this Mike linebacker just left to go cover Komet. Easy stuff. But he doesn't do it, even though it's open. He's going to turn his back to the defense. He's going to scramble around. And then once he's rolled out of the pocket, well, then he's going to find 13. And that's kind of the pros and cons of Justin Fields, right? He's not a laser-focused pocket passer at this moment. But he can make guys miss. And he can make plays on the move. And that's his strength. And I think everything good and bad about him, it's like, that meme where the kid uses the wrong equation but gets the right result and the teacher can't believe it. That's kind of what I feel like watching Justin Fields a lot of the time. Kind of a similar deal here where on this play, you've got this receiver breaking it inside and then settling down. Then you've got a clear out from the middleman in this bunch. And then Claypool is going to run like an out route. And the Lions are just going to play this straight up. 23, you've got this guy, you've got this guy, you've got this guy. And we're not going to read the releases or pass anything off. A lot of times what you'd see is, okay, if this guy is just going to run straight up the pipe, uh, this defensive back is going to stay on him. But as these guys switch, 23 is now going to take um, Chase Claypool on the outside release and the inside guy, Akuda is going to take this receiver on the inside release. But they don't do any of that. All right, they follow their guy wherever. And what that means is now Akuda is on Claypool with heavy inside leverage while Claypool is breaking an out route, right? And that's pretty easy right here. Fields is looking at it. You've got Claypool breaking this outside. Uh, Akuda is pretty far behind him. Lay that out towards the sideline and you've got a pretty easy first down. But Fields is like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to flip to the other side. I'm going to scramble around. You've got Komet running down the sideline, and he's open, and Fields gives him, honestly, a catchable ball on the back shoulder, right? But the degree of difficulty is much harder than just the quick game Claypool out route, right? He's, he's scrambling around, and he's holding on to the ball, and he's trying to create a big play out of structure. And it almost works, but at the end of the day, it doesn't. Now, I'm not one of those analysts who thinks every quarterback who creates out of structure isn't doing it right or stinks, right? Fields has made some incredible plays 
outside of structure. It gives Fields a really high ceiling because he has created first downs from looks that most quarterbacks would almost certainly fold under. And it is possible to design, and the Bears have done it these past couple weeks, to design a successful offense around Fields' unique skill set. And what that entails is, all right, if Fields doesn't want to stick around the pocket, we're just not going to make him do it. We're going to make him roll out, throw on the move. There's going to be some play action, occupy the linebackers, and then have him reverse field so they've got to track him down. He's got a lot of space and room to read things. And their bread and butter over these past couple weeks are these like flood concepts where he's rolling out to the side, and then you've got a short route developing down there, an intermediate one, and then like a deep route. And he can kind of make his pick, and if he doesn't like any of them, he can scramble. Right here, like, you could probably get this to Mooney, throw this out in front of Mooney. You could probably, if you're really good, throw this out in, in front of uh, Komet. He's not going to do either of those things. He's going to take off and run, but he's so fast that, you know, that works too. There's more than one way to do this, right? Let's give him some options to one side of the field. He doesn't have to throw it over the middle. He doesn't have to throw it in really tight windows if he wants to throw it. And he's got a full head of steam to scramble and, and pick up a good chunk of yardage if he wants to do that. That has been their bread and butter. Since week five of the season, Chicago has actually been a top 10 offense in the same range as Philadelphia and Dallas. And a lot of this has to do with how good their rushing attack is, and a lot of that has to do with fields, which I'll get into. But they're also slightly above average in dropback EPA per play, which is pretty surprising considering where they were through the first few weeks of the season, where fields was. And while he certainly has his weaknesses as a passer at this point, he also has his strengths, and they've been able to design an offense that is dangerous through the air. Let's get him on the move. Let's stretch this thing out horizontally. Everyone's scared of his scrambling ability. And then in the chaos, someone will get open behind the defense and Fields is good on the run. So he hits him in the back of the end zone. Touchdown. Just some quick stats on this before we move on. I'm categorizing quick game as some of these zero step drops, one step drops, three step drops, right? Getting the ball out quick. When you look at those shorter straight drop back type of throws, Justin Fields is 26th in the league in attempts on such passes, and he's one of the very few guys in the league who have played all 11 weeks. So that really speaks to just how low the rate of those plays are in this Bears offense. And he really hasn't been that good at them either. All right, his EPA on that quick game stuff is negative 61.69, which is the worst mark in the league even though he's attempted fewer than most quarterbacks. But then you look at these designed rollouts, and he's second in the league with 46 of those, and he's eighth in EPA on those designed rollouts. So much better on the move. And speaking of being better on the move, his rushing ability is crazy this season. If you look at all the rushers in the league and their combined, their total EPA, Justin Fields has added 45 points of EPA this season. That is double the next most valuable rusher, which is Josh Allen. Fields is double him. That is crazy what he adds to the Bears' rushing offense. And they run all kinds of things. You've got your typical zone reads, split zone here, uh, Justin Fields reading the end man on the line of scrimmage. He stays out. Okay, we're going to hand it off. Next, you've got a similar thing, but this time it's going to be with power. So you've got a bunch of down blocks and then the guard pulling through the B gap, right? He's reading the end man on the line of scrimmage again. This time he crashes inside. Fields keeps it himself, but that was attached to power. The first one was attached to zone. And then a third play in a row, you've got like a pin pull. You've got Komet pinning down uh, this defensive end and then the left tackle pulling around and you've got fields out on like this sweep out in space so all the different runs it's not just zone based or gap based it's everything and everything has options and motions and rpos attached to it it's a very complex running game and fields is one of the fastest players in the league at 6'3 230 pounds and if you bite on all the window dressing right the split zone action you've got both this defensive back and the linebacker occupying this gap, right? That make, means there's an opening right here. There's a lane right here. And Fields is just too fast. You can't give him anything like that. Just totally gone. There's not a lot of running backs 
in the league, much less six foot three, 230 pound running backs with that kind of home run speed. The other thing the Bears do is they're like, well, if we're not that good at running quick game and our quarterback is great at scrambling, we're just going to run a bunch of long developing routes down the field, you know, double posts, bringing everybody back. There is no one in the middle of the field here. And that makes it pretty easy for Justin Fields to take advantage of that space and scramble for first downs. And I'll say this about the quick game stuff. One more thing. It's not all Fields' fault. All right, he needs to pull the trigger on some of this stuff. But also, his wide receivers don't always give him a reason to trust them. On this play, you're going to have Dante Pettis running like a curl and then Darnell Mooney running a deep over, putting this defender in conflict. Does he come up to defend the curl or does he drop back to defend this deep over, right? And first of all, Dante Pettis is getting completely mugged at the bottom of the line of scrimmage here, so this takes a long time to develop. But second of all, you got Mooney running this deep over right here, but instead of running past the safety and creating the conflict here, he settles down and keeps himself covered so there is no conflict. Like Fields is looking at that ready to throw it, but Mooney fails him. He settles down. I don't know what he's doing, right? And now no one's open and Fields has to create something out of quite literally nothing. And the thing about Fields is he can go do that. And he picks up a first down. This is not a rare thing for Mooney, and I don't have the playbook, so I'm not exactly sure, but on this play, a third down, you've got the outside receiver pinning down this corner with a curl route, and then it really feels like Mooney should be running an out route or a go or a slot fade in behind it, a smash concept, because he's got vertical separation on this defensive back, go running behind it, stretch this dude out, and let Fields hit this at the sticks, or maybe this guy will stay on and you have have your guy beat. Maybe Fields can hit an explosive play towards the sideline here. That's really what it feels like this route should be. But instead, Mooney also, despite having vertical separation, settles at the sticks and brings 37 directly into the throwing lane of this curl route here. And Fields is looking at it, ready to throw it. But once Mooney settles down, all of a sudden he doesn't want to throw it anymore. And I kind of think Mooney ran the wrong route again here. And Fields is about to take a sack, but he's Justin Fields and he's a tank and he spins out of it and still almost manages to find Komet across the field. But it's a great play from uh, number three here to get his hands up and prevent that from happening. Kind of a similar deal here. It is third down and like five in a critical situation. And Chase Claypool at the top of the screen is getting off coverage. This is a situation where you settle down versus off coverage. All right, you just run your curl right at the top of your route here. Just, he's backing up too. Claypool's a deep threat. He's backpedaling. Claypool, just stay there. Stay there. Fields is looking that way. Just stay there. Make yourself available instead of running yourself into this defender and basically covering yourself here. Now you're not open and it's Claypool's own fault. So Fields has to move off that side and then perform this jump pass to, to Montgomery. And this still could have been a better throw from Fields, right? This is still something that you got to hit, honestly. But it's also a route that Claypool needs to perform better. I think. I don't know. I think that he has that option to settle down or move inside, but I'm not totally sure. My theory is that Justin Fields is a guy who loses faith in concepts and players pretty quickly, like last week or two weeks ago now. For example, they are running this tight end screen. Watch Komet. He's going to chip Hutchinson, and then he's going to release out into the route here. Now, Hutchinson does a good job recognizing this and getting back into coverage, but you can still kind of pop it over him and then hit Komet in behind it, right? And Fields double clutches, but then after a second, he tries it, but he overshoots, and this is a pick, a pick six that loses the game for Chicago. A bad moment for sure. And then the next week versus Atlanta, you've got your running back, Ebner, who is, again, chipping and then releasing into the flat for the screen, 
And it's not a perfectly clean look here. There is some guys in the way that Fields is going to have to loft it over. But, I mean, it's not necessarily unreasonable to expect him to do that. I mean, there is no one around Ebner. Just, like, throw it out there. But last week, he threw that pick six. And now he he doesn't really seem to want to do that anymore. He got scared, and he just completely abandons the structure of the screen and takes a sack. Same kind of deal here, right? You've got the running back looking for someone to block. There's no one, so then he releases out, and here comes a screen now. Fields is under pressure, but there is time to float that out in front of the running back here and try to hit him in space. But again, he threw that pick six last week. He doesn't really want to do it, and he's going to take a stack instead. And, you know, you don't want to make the same mistake again, but you also, like, have to do things. (laughs) You have to throw the screen pass when it's called. Justin Fields is not a player who is used to failure right at Ohio State. And he comes in the league with Matt Nagy and wide receivers who are running the wrong route. And I think he just kind of loses a lot of faith in throwing over the middle of the field and throwing in the design structure of the offense, right? I think it's kind of humiliating to have the rookie year that he had. So, like, there's an open guy here, but there's also some dudes in the way. So he just doesn't trust it. He's going to scramble around. And I feel like he's just more comfortable living in that world, the scrambling around world where he is in control. He's playing some hero ball, but at least it's up to him. I I don't think he quite trusts the pieces around him, and it's getting better and better as the year goes on, but it's not 100% there yet. This is a pretty crazy stat, but Justin Fields has only thrown short over the middle of the field a minuscule 31 times this year and has only completed 19 of those passes. 35 quarterbacks have completed more, and Justin Fields has played all 11 weeks of the season, right? There are some quarterbacks who are going to complete passes in that area hundreds of times this season. And you do need to hit those throws more often than the Bears do. And this is a problem that the Eagles struggled with last year with Jalen Hurts, and what did they do? They went out and got a great wide receiver on in-breaking routes, A.J. Brown. And looking at some of the receivers this year, who are really good on those in-breaking routes. I see DJ Moore is really good at them. He's someone who's been rumored in trades. Maybe you go out and try to get a guy like him. Maybe you go out and try to get a guy like Chris Godwin once the Bucks hit rebuilding mode and are trying to get some money off their books this offseason. Wouldn't surprise me to see something like that. Maybe you go out and draft a guy like Jackson Smith and Jigba who doesn't have blazing speed but is really nuanced in quick game stuff and is someone you can definitely trust to run the right route and has some repertoire with fields because they were both on that 2020 team. I could definitely see a move like that getting made. And it's one that I would make. I think it's one that I would make. I would really target him. Fields has the longest time to throw in the league at 3.12 seconds. It's him and Zach Wilson. And the scrambling stuff is great. The throws on the run are great. But I'd like to see this number go down. It'll make things easier on your offensive line. They won't have to protect as long. They won't look as bad. It'll be easier on your quarterback. He's not having to create so much. Get this guy someone to trust with timing and anticipation. Now, that's what I would do. I would prioritize getting another wide receiver, but I'm not sure if it's what the Bears will do because they've already invested what is currently the 34th overall pick in a wide receiver, Chase Claypool from Pittsburgh, and he hasn't really been performing, but if they think his problem is timing and routes, maybe that's something they think they can fix in an offseason. The Bears currently have the third overall pick in the first round, and there really aren't any wide receivers that are worth taking that high, and the prospect of drafting a guy like Will Anderson will definitely be tempting, or Jalen Carter, or something like that, especially because the offense has largely been fine for a good portion of the season, whereas the defense on the year is ranked 30th in EPA per play, one of the worst in the league, and there's just no talent on that front seven after the trades they made at the deadline. I'll say this, this defensive lineman free agent class is a lot better than the wide receiver class. There's a bunch of old players who are past their prime, but maybe a couple are still useful. But Dalvin Tomlinson, Jadavion Clowney might still be worth a look. Uh, You've got Dean Lowry and Puna Ford. Sheldon Rankins has been good for the Jets so far this 
this year. Deron Payne is having a great year. I honestly would be surprised if he hit the open market at this point. Marcus Davenport, there are options, and the Bears have a lot of cap space to, to plug some holes on, in the front seven in free agency. I think my plan for Chicago would be to take a guy like Will Anderson or Jalen Carter with that number three pick, sign some other defensive line pieces, and then with that second round pick that they've got from Baltimore, that 60 pick, try to trade back up, try to get a guy who you really like as a technical dude. Uh, to help the quick game. That'll in turn help the offensive line. Uh, There'll be less time for them to block and another year of development. And hopefully all of that together will create a better Bears team than what you're seeing right now and, and put them in the right direction. It's a copycat league. And I look at the success that Tua and the Dolphins are having after adding Tyreek Hill. I'm looking at the success that Jalen Hurts and the Eagles are having after adding AJ Brown. And I would say... I want my franchise quarterback to enjoy that same type of leap and adding a superstar wide receiver is the easiest way for him to make that leap. All right, so I'm not sure if the Bears will prioritize the wide receiver position after they spent pretty high draft capital on Chase Claypool. Maybe they think they like Darnell Mooney and Claypool and they just need a year in the system to teach him the routes better uh, and to get more on the same page with fields. Maybe they think with time, the wide receiving core will be fine and the more pressing issue is in the trenches. And honestly, I, I do get that. But man, I I just think that your number one asset is Justin Fields. And the thing that helps you most in the long term, like, yes, you do need to address the defensive line, absolutely, the front seven. But the number one priority is the development of your quarterback. And the number one way to do that is to get him a wide receiver. That should be priority number one. I would be, like I said, aggressively pursuing DJ Moore, aggressively pursuing Chris Godwin, really targeting Jackson Smith and Jigba or someone along those lines in the draft. And if I could get one of those guys without giving up the number three overall pick, which I do think is possible, and then I would draft Jalen Carter, who I think is the best prospect in the draft. I mean, I'm just playing make-believe GM right now, but that is kind of the groundworks of this plan. The offensive line needs addressing, but that might be later on day two, day three, some other free agents. Let these guys develop and hope the quick game improvement that the wide receiver bring brings makes their life easier that's kind of the plan for now and then maybe next year uh that then that's really an offensive line heavy year but it could be vice versa the bears could fix the trenches first and then go for the wide receiver you know maybe that makes a little bit more sense but i want to bring that guy in to develop fields as fast as possible this offseason if possible maybe the opportunity doesn't come up maybe no one's available maybe there aren't any good deals on the table i'm not saying it's a must but it's who i would prioritize and i think it's what the best version of the 2023 bears would look like would be the one with a with a better wide receiver one than darnell mooney that's for sure so anyway that's just my thoughts on the matter my thoughts on justin fields kind of my thoughts on the structure of the offense i think they're doing a good job gets he's doing a good job fields is coming along I'm, I'm optimistic about their future so that's just where i'm at with everything thank you guys so much for watching as always and i'll be back next week with another film review